Thank you for coming. I don't care if you're required to. I'm thankful you're here. And I'm going to do my best to preach hope. And I'm going to do my best to make sure that you leave here. You, you may not buy into or receive what's given to you, but I, I hope what's in here and what's in the Scripture, what we talk about tonight, gives you life because you showed up wet, wet, rainy, and cold tonight, and I deeply appreciate that. I, I want to start with something else that, sorry, Grace, you're helping cover slides here. I've never done this either. I, I've never slowed down long enough to say, hey, can we look at the lyrics of one of the songs? Um, Sierra, do I get this right? What song is that? <laughs> the one that goes, God is my shepherd, I won't be, what is it? How's it God forever? Can you bring up the lyrics for that song real quick? I've never done this either. Yeah, man, you're good. Oh, wow, that's so good. <laughs> so, I'm standing there in the back corner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm standing in the back corner. Wait, wait, put those lyrics back up again. I'm standing in the back corner, and you're coming in with towels over your heads, uh, cleaning your glasses, wet and everything, and I'm kind of trying to sing this. Uh, God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting. But I found this coming up in my own spirit, and I was thinking it about you as you're like, oh, it's rainy, it's wet, I'm going to go to chapel. I found myself saying this in between the lines. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting, but I do want. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. But man, there's so many things I want, God. If I'm honest, I do want things. And I started to realize that this psalm, this uh, 23rd psalm, if you sing it really honestly or you quote it really honestly, thank you, Grace, or if you quote it really honestly, or the same thing with the Lord's Prayer, if you deal with it really honestly, you have to be honest that a lot of the time that it comes out of us, we're not sure if we like what we're saying. We're not sure we even believe what we're saying. Because it's so, so powerful that it shapes and changes our reality that it's like crazy stuff. Do you realize you guys were singing? I was listening to your voices. The Lord is my shepherd, I won't be wanting. Is that true? Are you guys that plugged into Jesus, pl plugged into the, uh, the shepherd who is the one that watches out for that really you have no wants? Or is it more of a true battle of I don't want to be wanting. I want God to be my shepherd, but if I'm honest, I got a lot of wantings inside of me, so there's work that still needs to be done. Does that make sense? Or maybe I was the only silly one hanging out in the corner over there just trying to wrestle with wet students and the gospel and being honest. You just saw a little movie clip from an uh, old school movie called Master and Commander. And there's a reason that I showed it. It's not that I'm saying I like the movie or anything else, but why is the Lord's Prayer always prayed at funerals and movies? I don't know what it is. It, the Lord's Prayer seems to go with funeral moments. It is not a funeral prayer. It's supposed to be prayed all the time. It's supposed to be every day. The Lord's Prayer needs to be taken seriously. I want you guys to think about it a little bit. I kind of played it just so you would have a recognition that here's what's pretty intriguing. If you go anywhere and you stand outside, I don't know, 7-Eleven, because I love Slurpees. Anybody else love Slurpees? If you stand outside of a 7-Eleven, I think you and I would be surprised how many people could quote significant portions of the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of known. I don't know if people went to, uh, you know, Catholic school growing up. I don't know if they went to a spot where they heard it at a funeral. But a lot of people know what it is, but it's such a radical prayer. It's kind of crazy that a lot of culture knows what it is. Not just to be prayed at the Lord's Prayer. It's risky business. Here's one of the ways that I like that Stanley Hauerwas describes it. He says, the Lord's Prayer is a lifelong act of bending our lives towards God rather than us bending God towards our will. A lot of times the way we pray, God, I got some work for you. Hey, God, I know I'm not a Messiah, but I'm pretty close to the Messiah. Here's what you need to do, right? I mean, that's the way that we pray. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer that is so simplistic that it's basically in the process of working on us to bend us towards the will of God. I, I like words like revolution. I've never been a part of a real one. Uh, I like words like a coup, like this is crazy, let's overthrow it, right? Uh, I like words like subversion. Subversion isn't always negative. 
I think that the Lord's Prayer is subversive. I think the Lord's Prayer is a crazy coup that wants to take over our life. I think it's revolutionary in the sense that it works everything against what you and I would probably on any average day wake up and want to do or live. And so if you only save the Lord's Prayer for funerals, you are missing the prayer that can shape every day what it means to live and exist in the world and maybe at some point really be able to sing, the Lord is my shepherd and I'm really not wanting. I might be cold and wet, but I don't want. I'm so taken care of. And if that sounds radical, crazy, it is. But that's what God wants to do is take care of us in every way. The Lord's Prayer can be found in two different locations. In Matthew, what I like, how it works, is the disciples are hanging out with Jesus. And in Luke chapter 11, we have it written on the backdrop back here. The disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. I'm so curious what they would have been thinking when they asked that question. All right. We're going to get the magic formula. If I say giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, go, Lord, 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 I'm going to get what I want to, right? It's going to be a formula. Jesus is going to give me the inside track. And in Luke chapter 11, the Lord's prayer is actually even a little bit shorter. And Jesus says, all right, here's how you should pray. In Matthew, the one we're going to look at over the next couple weeks, it's a little bit more basic. Jesus just looks at the disciples in Matthew 6, verse 9, and says, this then is how you should pray. A lot of you that have heard this prayer or prayed it know that at the ending we say, of some like for the eyes of the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Technically in Matthew, it's not in here. It's this basic in Matthew. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen. Over the next five weeks, we're going to break that up section by section and try to really wrestle with what is this risky revolutionary language that Jesus gave his disciples and gives to us really mean? And how could it shape us if we found ourselves praying it with one another or even praying it by ourselves? Tonight, we're going to look seriously at our Father in heaven Hallowed be your name. We're going to start with our Father. How many of you love praying in public? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you love praying in a small group with like four or five people? If I were to hang out with you, I'd grab you and I'd be all hanging out together and I'd say, Johnny, pray. Or, hey, Susie, why don't you pray? You know how many times I get called shoes and I'm like, uh uh-uh. Public prayer, for some reason, is something that you and I, at moments, aren't necessarily quick to jump on. We're kind of like, yo, that's my private life. I got my own formula. I got my own way of communicating. I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know if I get it right. When Jesus was asked how to pray, Jesus did not say, pray like this. My Father, as I sit in my my room by myself where nobody else could see me or hear me, Jesus says, our Father. It's in the plural. It's a big we prayer. It's about all of us together being on the same page, caring about the important things that God wants to do. It's a very public prayer. It's crazy for me as I work here with you, and notice how often um, we don't necessarily have moments where uh, we're intentionally doing things uh, like the Lord's Prayer. I love evening prayers chapel. I love liturgical chapel. And it's a part of the tradition and the liturgy in both of those that the Lord's Prayer is said often. And here's what I would say. Good for APU that there are spaces where it's consistent. But you know what I'm also really hoping? Where does this prayer break out with roommates? Two years ago, a bunch of freshmen were here. And I had a freshman grab me later uh, on in that year. And they said, Woody, I am so glad you just cut the... Cut the ice or whatever you want to say, describing, like, making things easier for us. And you actually told us that we should be talking about Jesus with our roommates because we didn't feel real safe to do that before that. Isn't it weird, like, how sometimes in a Christian university there's so much God talk in public settings, in classroom settings, or part of an alpha group, or maybe in your workplace, but then when just everyday normal average shows up, it's like, uh, I'm feeling stuck or awkward. How does this come out of me? This corporate... 
which is kind of business language, but it's used in large settings where a crowd of people come together. Or maybe we would say the community prayer, or maybe better yet, because it's all family language, we'd say the body of Christ prayer is very plural. Our Father. I want to talk about this for a second because I think there's a little bit of ouches that is involved with this at moments. Um, my wife is such a great reader, and sometimes she knows what we're going to be studying in Kaleo, and she gives me something really good. And I want to read it to you. This might be hitting some of the things that some of you are already thinking. And you thought God adopted you because you were good looking. You thought he needed your money or your wisdom. Sorry, God adopted you simply because he wanted to. You were in his goodwill and pleasure, knowing full well the trouble you would be and the price he would pay. He signed his name next to yours and changed your name to his and took you home. Your Abba adopted you and became your father. May I pause here for a minute? Most of you are with me, but a couple of you, or maybe in this room even a lot of you, are shaking your heads. I see those squinty eyes. You don't believe me, do you? You're waiting for the fine print. There's got to be a gimmick. You know life has no free lunch, so you're waiting for the check. Your dif- discomfort is obvious. Even here in God's living room, you never unwind. Others put on slippers. You put on a front. Others relax. You stiffen. Always on your best behavior, ever anxious that you'll slip up and God will notice, and out you'll go. I understand your anxiety. Our experience with people has taught us that what is promised and what is presented aren't always the same. And for some, the thought of trusting a heavenly father is doubly difficult because your earthly father disappointed or even mistreated you. If such is the case, I urge you, don't confuse your heavenly father with the fathers you've seen on earth. Your father in heaven isn't prone to headache and temper tantrums. He doesn't hold you one day and hits you the next. The man who fathered you may play such games, but the God who loves you never will. It's from The Great House of God by Max Lucado. I have a very, very close, close dear friend that will remain nameless tonight, but often tells me of a dad that they sat on the front porch for waiting to be picked up for things like birthdays and weekends And realizing after two, three hours, once again, dad had forgotten. I want to be so careful here tonight not to quickly assume that when you hear plural, us, we, and then that word father, that some of you are going, oh, yes, Abba, daddy, God, watch out for us, care for us. When I'm wet from the rain, figure out how to take care of my needs. When I'm short on cash and can't pay for my books, God, be available. Some of you are like, dad, in every way, shape, and form, is a negative word because I've never seen it lived out positive on this earth. That is not the God of heaven. When Jesus says this is how we will pray, there is so much relational emphasis here. Jesus mentions the Father. Some students I were talking about will go, where's the Holy Spirit? Why is it the Holy Spirit in this prayer as well? There's almost an assumption here that if you understand the dynamic relationship between the Father and the Son, and you finish reading the rest of the gospel, and Jesus says, when I leave, another one is coming, the Holy Spirit, the comforter that's going to be here for you, that in here there is so much relational language that there is a redeeming way that God can work, that if you have experienced Father in the most heartbroken way, that there is a God that's different than any dad we have ever experienced. And some of you have had great dads and still been deeply disappointed. That is not God the Father. The passages that probably Max Lucado was thinking of could be one of these. Something like Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 6. How blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high place of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind. I love that part. He had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son. 
Since I've studied the Lord's Prayer the last couple of years, when I now say, Our Father, I have this sense of one welcoming. I have this sense of the believers that came before me teaching the Lord's Prayer to person by person. Do you guys realize you're being handed off something that was given to the disciples? Like when we say our, I almost want to stop there for a second. And no, it's not a pirate word, our, right? No. But when we say our, I sit there for a second and go, when I say our, I'm highlighting all the generations clear back to the first disciples that asked Jesus how we should pray. And when I say our, I'm not just saying the people that are in this room are. I'm saying our and all the Christ followers, generation after generation. When I say our, I'm talking about all the believers around the world. Do you realize how powerful even the first three letters are together? O-U-R. Our Father. We've been adopted. We've been welcomed. We stand with others. It reminded me of a short video clip that I saw the other day out of the movie Antoine Fisher, a young man that finally gets enough going on in his life that's right and good that he is finally come to the moment where he's going to go home. And I want you to see what it's like to be a part of our, what it's a part of what it means to be family and what it means to maybe get to a point where we could say father together. Watch this clip real quick about family. When they open the doors and he sees all the generations, the grandparents and everybody else. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, when I pray the Lord's Prayer, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what would it be like if when we say "R," we're managing the generations of followers and what it means for the good, good Father to watch out for all those generations and to watch out for us. Our Father in and of itself could be a sermon on its own. The second part tonight, I want to make sure we don't skip over, is in heaven. And uh, to quote a, a student that was talking to uh, the other day, heaven's a weird concept. Let's just be honest. How, how do you describe it? When we say our Father in heaven, are we supposed to look up? Or is it down? Or is it to the side? Or is it everywhere? Is it in the trees and everything else? I mean, you got to really think through theologically when it talks about in heaven. Why is that in the Lord's Prayer? Why did Jesus say, here's how you should pray? Our Father in heaven. It's almost like God has an address or a location. And as soon as I said the word location, I had a student this last week going, oh man, I know we're trying to get outside the box of, of imagining that we have God in our own control and can put God in a little box, put it in our pocket, and we can bend God's will with our prayers. But it's also kind of scary if you say the word heaven and your only understanding of heaven is this little box in the sky where God is trapped, right? I mean, you really need to think through location, location, location. No, don't think location. Think cosmic. Think the heavens and the Psalms when it talks about the expanses of things that we can't even imagine, seen and unseen. Will Willimon kind of wrote something that I think really helped me. It says this, heaven is the name given to God's realm. Notice realm isn't necessarily a location or an address. And the reason heaven is used, this cosmic concept, idea, this reality that God has been preparing as well as working in this spot. Because remember, later in the Lord's Prayer, what does it say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? That, that this whole concept of the realm of heaven, of where God is not in our little box of right here on the platform. Can you imagine these really traditional, they were trying to follow a rabbi, a teacher, disciples, and they were thinking of, well, God's in that little spot called the temple, and we hope God's presence will always stay in there. Can you imagine how radical this prayer would have been? Uh, the God we're talking about, realm-wise, we don't put in a box. But let's be really careful, too, that when we pray and say, our Father, which art in, I don't know if I'm looking up as much as I'm going, in heaven that I can't even imagine, when, where, how, what, bigger than me, larger than me, cosmic, the God who is so uncontrollable, it's shocking to be able to even address. Listen to some of the passages out of Hebrews. There was a, a couple different spots that I was reading this weekend that was talking about this in Hebrews, and it really put a point where it reminded me of what we read this last semester in um, Kaleo. This is Hebrews 12, 18 through 19. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken. 
For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews, the author, the Christian that was so excited about sharing this with Christians in Rome, was describing God as a consuming fire, something that we don't control, we don't own. And then in this prayer when it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, you and I do not control this one that is in a realm that you and I don't even know how to describe and so beyond us, but we know it exists. And this place where God's rule is sovereign and where God is also working to create that same rule in this place. And so when I pray, our Father who art in heaven, there's part of me going, yeah, I'm pretty small and God is pretty significant. I can't believe I even get to pray to this one. This last one that I wanted you guys to think through before I'm going to actually ask you to join me in this practice is, hallowed be thy name. Listen to two different quotes by St. Augustine. Because you made us for yourself, our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Augustine was talking about God and what it means to so deeply follow this one, that there is nothing that will satisfy or work in us, and therefore this hallowed be thy name business is so significant, we can't hallow, praise, worship anything else. I like what else Augustine says when he says, we imitate what we adore. Um. I was laughing at old school little kid memories. When I used to say, hallowed be thy name, all I could think of was All Hallows Eve or the Headless Horseman when I was a kid. Like I just did not grasp hallowed. What does hallowed mean? Could I just shift it and change it and say, all praise, all glory, all worship. Our Father, all the generations, back to the disciples that were given this and then the storyline of God through all the Old Testament, are around the world Christ for Father, not the broken, hurtful examples of Father that we have in our everyday life, but the Father of all fathers. Our Father in heaven, praise, praise, glory, glory be thy name. In Exodus, it was so shocking that Moses was given a name for God. You know, God doesn't have to give us intimacy, name, recognition. God could say, here's my son, Jesus Christ. And when the disciples asked Jesus Christ for how should we pray, Jesus said, you don't pray. That God is not addressable. Uh, He's not available to you. The living Lord of all is not even want to hear from you. Just don't even bother. Maybe drop off a postcard at the temple and if God gets around to it and wants to pay attention, maybe. Do you realize how significant not only is the praise, praise, worship, worship, but the your name, like the fact that we've been given permission to be in these intimate conversations with the living God who has created all things. It's the season of Lent. I loved it that Kyle read a little something from... Um, Henry Nouwen's book, Show Me the Way. And it talked about giving space in prayer. I want to do something tonight because some of you have very little space and very little time to do stuff. I want to give you some reflection time of our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Because what we're going to do tonight is we're going to actually pray that together, but I want us to understand and risk revolution in our lives where our will could be bent towards the will of God, where someday we might be able to pray and say, oh man, God, you're the one that provides bread on the table. I'm going to wait for that every day. How does that look? What does it mean to trust? And what I want us to do is really be able to pray that from a space of uh, real expectancy and real belief that God is the only way to put all of our hope and all of our trust in. Uh, tonight's kind of a special night uh, for me and, and really encouraged by something that's happening on the front row. I have a friend here that in a very short amount of time uh, spent two weeks getting to know and never knew if I would see you again this side of heaven, right? In the front row is uh, Pastor Edward. And uh, two years ago, uh, APU um, had a trip that went to Uganda to work with uh, an orphanage by the name of Akani Juka. And in that orphanage, Pastor Edward was clearly called to create space for little kids who had no fathers, no mothers, and to provide education, provide a place to live, provide love. 
And for me, it's such an honor that we're talking about this language of what it means to be adopted in the, the kingdom and the family of God. And I got to see you live that ministry out every day in Uganda. It's the coolest thing. Pastor Edward got a visa and had a chance to come study and continue his education in seminary through Fuller. And he wanted so badly to come see the school that was sending him students to do two to three months of service trips and everything else. And it kind of gives me just these holy yeahs inside that God got a chance and we get to see each other again this side of the realm of heaven before we get to celebrate. You know what it's like when you see a fatherless, motherless child finally have a place to lay down their head, huh? What it means for them to have three square meals, what it means for them to get an education, what it means to begin to have a family home where there's like a house mom that takes care of them. And in some ways, it's an example of what God wants to do long term. Pastor Edder, what I'd love to do, would be a huge honor to me, is I would love for you to pray that even though many of these students know who mom and dad are, some don't, would you just pray that the Heavenly Father would take care of them in every way possible? Because the brokenness here, in many ways, is the human brokenness that's everywhere around the world. And so, Pastor Edward, come up here. I got a microphone, and there's stairs right over there. And and here's the reflection I want to do. He's going to take his time praying for you tonight. When he's done... I'm going to ask that you would stand and say the Lord's Prayer with me. And after we say the Lord's Prayer, um, the band has a couple real fitting songs uh, that we're going to sing. One of them being the first one, Good, Good Father. And tonight, I just really want to believe what does it mean for, for God to really just do something significant. But first, you have to do this. Will you welcome all the way from Uganda, Pastor Edward. It's really good that you're here. Um, Okay, there we go. And you're already on. Thank you. Thank you. I bring you greetings from Uganda, from your brothers and sisters. Amen. They love you so much. And uh, I hope I will get time to chat with you. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are our, you are our Father. Mm. Many times we don't know how to relate to you. But I pray that you teach us. That you help us to relate with you as our heavenly father. Mm. It's God. God bless. There are so many, Lord, who have. Who cannot get the concept of, how, of what a father is. There are those, Lord, that are coming from broken families. Mm-hmm. I pray, Lord, that you help them. Mm-hmm. I pray, Lord, that you may help them to understand what Heavenly Father is. Mm-hmm. Lord, I thank you that you are our Father. I thank you that you provide for us. Mm-hmm. And I commit every student that is here. I pray, Lord, that you provide. I pray, Lord, that you give them the best education. I pray, Lord, that even those who don't have a school fees and who don't have Mm. a father who cannot care for them, I pray, Lord, that you you are the father to the fatherless. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that you father them. Mm. I pray that you provide for them. I pray that you show them your love. In the name of Jesus, I have prayed. Amen.